and uh, cool. So the session is currently recorded. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, today, we, we are having BGA Early Career Group event. Um, it's a new series called Innovation in Geotechnical Engineering. Um, it's a series of events and lectures hosted by recently formed BGA Early Career Group in the Southwest region. It's a platform for knowledge sharing between academy, academy and industry to promote rigorous discourse um, between young professionals in the field. And we are trying to focus on three themes. The first one is technical knowledge, second is sustainability, and the third one is digi digital transformation. So we're very honored to have um, Nicola Carr today from Roger Bullivant to share with us um, the development, or to share with us on topic of development of continuous displacement auger pile. Um, so a bit of housekeeping, um, please keep your microphones on mute and what cam what comes then off. Well, it's fine if you want to turn it on. Um, if you you have any question, just feel free to post them on the chat box um, throughout the the presentation. And at the end of it, we'll have a Q and A session where your your questions will be answered. It is currently recorded and it should last approximately forty five minutes. So I'm going to introduce um, Nicola Kerr. So Nicola has over 14 years of experience working within the piling industry. She now works as senior designer estimate, uh, slash estimate at Roger Bullivant, dealing with a wide range of piling and ground improvement techniques across the UK. And she is going to share with us um, presentation on, on the topic. So I'll leave that with you, Nicola. I'll stop sharing. Perfect, thank you. Beverly, just one second, I'll get my PowerPoint set up. Let it be a no, moment. No worries. Is that coming through loud and clear? Is that okay? Yep, can Perfect. see that. Oh, still people coming in deep in away there. <laughs> right. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Uh, okay, sorry, so I was muted. Okay, you know, let's get out of the way. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today at this BGA event. Uh, as you very kindly introduced me, and my name is Nicola Carr. I'm a senior design and estimated engineer at Roger Bullivant. I've been working in the piling and ground improvement industry since I graduated from my bachelor's degree in 2006. Uh, I'm now a graduate of geotechnical engineering from University of Birmingham, where I finished my master's finally in 2016. And I'm very fortunate to be involved in the development of piling techniques via our research and development team, uh, which is within our company. Uh, so today I'd like to speak to you about one of our piling products, which I've been quite heavily involved in over the last few years. So this is our continuous displacement auger, or for short, CDA pile. <clears throat> uh, so firstly, I'm going to just outline the structure of today's presentation. So in this presentation, I'm going to begin just by outlining our research and development setup that we have here at Roger Bullivant. I'm then going to speak a little bit about the CDA pile itself. So firstly and importantly, why did we want to invest in this particular product? What are the benefits of this particular product type? We're going to have a look at what we actually did to get our development process off the ground, through from our initial conception, the modifications we carried out following trials that we did, to the final product, which is now being offered by our company for some projects in 2020. So we've had two projects in 2020 that have been completed, which is great for us. And I'm gonna show you a bit about these at the end of the presentation. I'm looking to leave about 10 minutes at the end of the talk for any questions you may have, if I don't waffle on too much. So if you could just jot these down or, or write them on the forum uh, to hang on to those, that would be ideal. Uh, so I just want to get started <clears throat> with the structure of our research and development teams here at Roger Bullivant. So we have a wider R&D team. This is actually then structured into specialised research streams. So this way, the projects and the personnel can be grouped by the process. 
So for example, our CDA pile, the topic of today's talk, that sits within our pile and techniques team. And we like this approach because this involves people from throughout the business. Um, and we see this as an advantage because it brings together the expertise we have as a business in our operational aspects, our engineering and the production skill colleagues, and also some of the central support function colleagues as well. Uh, so I personally believe this is uh, critical for the way that we develop R&D um, and for the success of this within our company. We are striving to achieve our five business strategic goals. So everybody's expertise is going to be valuable in achieving this. So you can see here our five strategic business goals. These are safety, work winning, profit, people and innovation. Uh, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about why these are actually all relevant to our research and development. <clears throat> So the projects themselves, these are allocated to a specific R&D team. Uh, this team have a responsibility for ensuring that all the costs are reported through the business, uh, through the development of the product or the system in some cases, and the progress is reported back on a quarterly basis to the company by the team. This will also include any results that we've had during that quarterly period. And we also have regular quarterly meetings so we can all meet together as a team. The uh, research and development process that we've established here in Roger Bullivant, um, I see it's clearly key in developing successful products, but also it's quite an essential process to close out any projects that we deem to be no longer viable for any reason. So it might be um, something to do with uh, developments in safety, for example, on site means we can't use a certain technique. Um, this is vital in order to save us wasting our time on continuing development and costs for these types of projects that we're not interested in uh, anymore. So the projects initially, they get scored against the five strategic goals we have for opportunity and also feasibility of the product. These scores are get reviewed regularly every quarter. Um, so as I was mentioning, for example, there might be a project which looks really good initially uh, as a good opportunity, but we may find that it's not feasible due to limitations, potentially in technology or maybe in new legislation, for example. So you can see here in the middle of the screen, this is our Pylon Techniques current team scores for the products. Um, our CDA pile, this is currently identified as the highest score in project we have in our team. Uh, this is our opportunity feasibility score here. So you can see that the CDA product is deemed a priority project for us. I've also put up an example of a research and development cycle here on the screen top left. Uh, this is from Borg and Gaul. And it shows the various stages of development of a product from the research through to the product dissemination. So you'll, you'll find out if you, you looked at this online, there's many models for how to implement research and development cycle. But I personally like this particular one because I think it includes all the stages that we've adopted along our CDA pile development. We've got the initial research and product development. So this is carried out to allow us to be able to carry out our early tests and initial trials. You have then the subsequent product revision before you get through to the final product. Because as you'll find, if you get involved in anything like this, um, inevitably the concept you first came up with, it's not perfect from the beginning and it does need some refinement. So what I think I'm going to do is use this R&D cycle model as the basis for today's presentation. So I'm going to put this in the top right corner of each slide at different corresponding stage of the CDA product development so we can follow this through. <clears throat> So before we actually get on to the R&D cycle itself, we had to make sure we thought about why we actually wanted this product. So why did we want to invest our time, energy and money in a new cast in situ displacement pile system? So thinking about this question actually sets up our scope for the project. Uh, it allows us to determine what the aims are of the project and also gives us direction for our research and development to go in. So while some of you might know, um, Roger Bullivant actually already has a cast in situ displacement pile. This is our continuous helical displacement. So this is CHD pile. Uh, these are shown actually on this slide. These piles are quite distinctive. They have a screw shaped or helical profile, as you can see it here on the right hand photograph. So these piles, we install these using a tool that's developed and refined by Roger Bullivant during the 1990s. You can see a bit of um, a sketch of that on the left of the screen here. The geotechnical design of this actual type of pile, it's not the same as what you might see for, say, a steel screw pile. And it's more adapted from a design process that was uh, first established a bit more mainstream in Belgium during the 1970s. So it's going back a little while that it's been used. 
there are quite a few papers actually online um, if you Google that to talk about the design of the pile. The, the tool we use at Roger Bullivant, this consists of a central core uh, and a trapezoidal flight, uh, which is at a set pitch. So this has been refined over time um, to create the smooth profile of the pile that you can see here. <clears throat> so the photograph on the right, this shows a CHD pile. Um, this one's actually been excavated uh, from an overconsolidated clay site uh, in Mill Hill in North London. So you can see that this installation method, it gives us a nice, smooth, consistent screw shaped shaft in this particular type of material. What we're doing by that is we're generating quite a large area to obtain our skin friction for the pile from the surrounding ground. So due to this sort of screw shaped pile uh, and also the displacement method we're using to install it, you do have this large amount of skin friction developed uh, in an oversolidated clay particularly, so when the pile is loaded. This is relatively high really when you consider the amount of concrete we're actually using during installation of the pile. So as a result of all this, the pile is highly efficient at providing a loading capacity and it does perform very well when we put it under a test load. We do have a really large database of all the pile tests that we've carried out over the last 30 years or so. So we're pretty confident in the performance characteristics of this pile type in those ground conditions. Uh, we do have a large range of ground conditions, as you all know, across the UK. So the interaction between the soil and the tool does vary with the type of ground that we're working in. So with this large amount of experience we have and data that we've gathered, we can also be a bit confident with our design parameters in different types of ground and we know what we're doing going forwards with that on day-to-day -day projects. So the different types of ground conditions that we have, they do react differently with the installation of a large displacement pile system. The schematic I've got here in the centre of the slide, uh, this is just a sketch put together for the anticipated interaction for uh, the tool with a stiff clay, or it could be the case of a denser sand. Um, so more soils movement be expected in this sort of pattern in a dense or stiff material, this is because when you've got a stiff or dense material, it tends to dilate uh, when it's under larger displacement. If we have a site where we have a looser granular material, you're looking at a more localised compaction taking place of the materials relative to the pile and tool shaft. So really, with our CHD pile, I guess in summary, it's quite large displacement of the soils that's been experienced. We're getting relatively high loads out of the pile, and in conjunction with that, we're getting relatively low displacements at our working load. OK, so as you can see from the previous slide, the CHD pile is quite a substantial pile. Uh, so at Roger Bullen, we currently are offering a 300 mil, 600 mil diameter pile. So you have a 300 millimeter core and 600 millimeter out of flight. And we also offer the 400, 700 variety as well. They are really efficient in design and they're already quite a large pile size. So when you're looking at quite light loadings, these piles are barely moving, even when we put them in quite short. So really for our lightly loaded piles, mainly when we're looking at our low rise structures, your CHD pile can often be a bit too robust uh, to provide something that's economic in the marketplace. Our main competition for our cast and situ displacement that we already have is our small diameter CFA piles. So we're typically talking 300 mil diameter, so small piles for light structures. So we wanted to try and provide an economic alternative to these particular CFA piles. And we want to do that by developing a product that can make use of the efficiency that we're getting by using a displacement technique. So that's providing an enhanced shaft capacity in comparison to CFA. And we also wanted to make sure we're providing a cost effective option that performs more appropriately to the specification for the structures that we're actually building. In addition to that, we want to make sure that we're using the expertise that we've already developed um, with our installation method of CHD, because we do use bespoke rigs for that. Uh, with tools and poles accordingly designed specifically for this pile type. Uh, we want to create a leaner version of that product. So the first thing we did uh, is set ourselves some goals for the product. So this allows us to define the scope of the trials, just make sure we're targeting these particulars when we're setting up um, our trials. The main goals that we came up for the product were that it had to have less concrete than the CHD piles for an equivalent load that it must provide us with reduced muck away when comparing to the CFA pile. And importantly, as a result of this, to provide a more economic price for our customer uh, on their overall scheme, because um, we need to make sure the product actually has a place in our market and is viable for us to use, uh, because at the end of the day, we are a business. 
So we'll look at a bit about how we went about this. <clears throat> so there are varying displacement tools available across the globe. Um, different companies have different tools. Different countries adopt different methods of installing cast in situ displacement piles. So as a result of this, part of the research, we reviewed some existing literature and looked at the makeup of some of these other tools. Um, in the back of our mind, obviously, is our CHD tools already quite successful with the rigs that we have uh, in our fleet. So we did decide in the end to look at this as our actual starting point for our new product. So our CHD tool, which we looked at a couple of slides ago that's existing, this just uses torque to install the pile. So it doesn't have any crowd at the top other than the self weight of, of the um, installation head itself. So the flight is actually pulling the tool into the ground. This then also creates that distinctive screw shaped profile that we saw. So what we're thinking is, well, could we really use the same basic installation method of rotation for our new CDA pile? And um, so we're really changing the purpose of the flight from both installation and giving us a nice pile shape to just using it for installation purposes and not forming the flight. So looking at our current equipment that we already had, uh, the core we had for the smaller CHD pile, that's already 300 millimetre diameter. So this is already the ideal diameter for the product against the 300 mil CFA piles that we're, we're looking to compete against. So what we decided to do, we decided to try and construct what is effectively a flightless CHD pile. And that will be then cast to the diameter of the core of the tool. So you can see here on the right of the screen, this is one of our very first prototype bullets. And um, these were welded. And this is on site at Seven Oaks down in Kent. Uh, in this instance, we've got a thin CFA type flight that's welded to a central core, a 300 mil diameter, uh, at a pitch that we'd set similar to our CHD to allow it to screw into the ground. The first project we actually trialled the CDA pile on, this was in West London at a place called Ryslip. So Ryslip we selected as ideal for our first trial uh, because of several reasons. So firstly, it was the soils on site. So the profile of soils that had limited made ground and other variable soils from a shallow depth we had London clay encountered. This is a benefit to us because it's one of the best studied soils in the UK. There are plenty of reference materials available on the properties of this material. Uh, and also it has been studied um, in larger displacement and its behaviour under larger displacement. So we could use that information when we're looking at our own technique. The London clay and rice slip as well, it also exhibited a very nice steady gradient so you've got a good strength increase with depth. So that took out a bit of the variable um, of some engineering judgment, which is otherwise known as your best fit line. So we had a bit more direct information to base it on. The second reason why we liked rice lift as a trial site is we actually had CFA and CHD piles already on site because it's a live project and they were already being tested. So we had some really good information to directly compare our new product to in terms of performance. Uh, the third reason, which is usually the one that holds me up and is the most important, is the client would actually let us install a test pile because you'll find if you ever get involved in anything that you have to trial things on site, um, it's always a bit of a challenge when you're trying to field try a product on someone else's live site. It's a bit, bit tricky to get the space available in the time. This first trial that we did in Rice Slip, this was very successful. So you can see here the load against displacement for the piles that we tested on the Rice Slip site. So the CDA pile is actually labelled on here as thin flight on the dotted blue line. And the other working tests that we did on site, these are shown in green and orange. So our 10 metre long CDA pile, this only actually gave us 10% less load than the same length CHD pile for the same maximum displacement. And you only lost 1.2% capacity compared to a 19 metre CFA pile. So that's pile that's almost double its length. Um, to install the pile, we used 40% less concrete for the CDA pile compared to the long CFA pile. And we used 25% less concrete compared to the same length CHD pile as well. So we're starting to look at some of our areas that we come up with in our scope. As a result of these initial trials, we were really encouraged with these initial test results. This appeared to show that the product was performing as we would have hoped. And also, for example, it's using less concrete, so it's starting to tick some of our required boxes for our development. So following this, we say we were very encouraged by the results of these initial trials that we did in 2016. And we went on to install further piles for testing. This was using the original prototype tools that was through 2017 and on into 2018. And during this particular time, our CHD pile, the original one, 
was also being further developed. We were trying to convert this um, from the old welded bullet to what is now our patented modular system. So with our new product looking potentially like a viable product to pursue, we decided to do this a bit in tandem and develop the product prototype into a modular tool also, so that everything could kind of sit within the modular framework. We're lucky in Roger Bullivant, so we have access to 3D printing, and our R&D manager produced the 3D printed model of the designed CDA tool. This was initially in order that the fit could be checked, and you can see this here on the left of the slide. With this modular system, the sections are manufactured by a specialist company, which are based off site, so they do have significant setup costs for molding. Because of this, the 3D printing model we saw as a very valuable step for us to take before we commit to a final design and pay to have moulds set up for something that we might need to refine later. And then the picture in the centre of the screen, this is the first modular bullets that we had delivered for CDA. It's the first photo I had uh, seeing those delivered into our business. So now we have our tool kind of set for our, for our works. You've got this map here on the right. So this shows the sites which we have installed trial piles or test piles on so far up to today. So you'll note these are initially concentrated around southeast of England. So I was located in this area up until 2019. So I was um, involved in the design for these projects and able to obtain and monitor trials on site with the southeast team that we had. This area of the country actually already has the ground conditions where uh, we're seeing CDA to be a benefit. So we did see this as a really good place for us to start. Uh, we did have an earlier trial in Scotland than the one that's shown on here on the map. However, unfortunately, due to site reasons, the pile wasn't able to be tested. However, in 2019, we were successful at installing our first trial pile in Scotland. This was within Silty Sands at a site in Glasgow. The, the pile actually performed really well in the ground conditions we had and it gave us valuable information for the design of the pile and these types of ground conditions going forwards. In a further move to go out of the southeast of England, in 2020, we secured a project in Swindon and we were able to test a sacrificial test pile on this site. This data gathering process overall is really essential in us looking to decide what our parameters are for the pile to take forward. And we need to expand the location for the trials. This would be essential in order to bring the product forward because we are a national business. So what were some of our results? We collected varying different types of data from our trial piles. The static testing, this was done to obtain data on the actual pile performance under load on site. Uh, this was our initial focus because we needed to ensure that the pile was going to provide a viable product that was fit for the purpose that we intended it for. Where we could, we loaded the test piles to the highest achievable test load that we could get to. Um, this was obviously um, given the site safety and time constraints of individual projects. With the testing themselves, we used reaction anchor piles to provide the test loading for the trial piles on each of these sites. So here on screen, you can see a summary table of the projects, which are from the previous location map. This shows the length of the piles that were installed for each test, and also a bit of a summary on the set of ground conditions that were present on that site. The majority of our trials, they are within over-consolidated clays. This is generally due to the site location. We have also now started to branch out into other ground conditions, for example, those sands up in Glasgow. We're making sure we're recording the performance of the pile and the static testing. Uh, and every time we did the trials, the pile consistently performed at or in excess of our expectations during the trials. We started to keep ourselves a database to just make sure we had every little bit of information that we gathered from our efforts and we need to capture this for our design development going forwards. As well as the pile performance, it's also essential for us to ensure that it's actually practical to install the pile uh, and that we could take the opportunity to optimise the installation as we went along. So the rigs we use at Roger Bullivant, these are instrumented and they record all the aspects of our pile installation from our drilling speed and extraction speed, uh, concrete volumes and also a bunch of more information. So these records, we can easily access these remotely and we've made sure we save these against each trial pile that we installed. This way we were able to look at the installation parameters for the piles. We could check for anything that looks unusual and also for a bit of consistency between the trial piles installed and the expected ground conditions. In addition to this information, it's also important for us to understand other impacts on site from displacement pile installation. For example, some levels changes due to the large displacement being undertaken. 
So for example, at Ashford, we made sure we tried to capture this within our trials and we did some surveying uh, of levels at different stages during the works. <clears throat> uh, another item that we were able to try on site is we were looking at installation using our rigs and we needed to understand the energy that was required to actually put the pile in. Um, so we have purchased what we call an IntelliTalk system. This is um, a bit of kit that accurately measures torque required for installation of the pile. Our CDA tool, the new one, is actually small displacement by area than our usual CHD pile. So we were considering whether we actually needed the same amount of energy to install the pile as we did the CHD. If we could reduce this um, requirement, this would allow us to potentially optimise the installation onto smaller rigs. So at the moment it's on our larger rig system. So we incorporated this IntelliTalk trial into our site trial programme at Ealing. So at Ealing, we were unable to install any pile tests themselves due to the space and time available on site. But we were still able to gain some information by installing several piles in the same location with this particular torque monitoring. During the, all the trials on site, the feedback from site was really, really important. I have absolutely no idea how to drive a rig or drill a pile. Uh, but our site teams have an awful lot of experience with our rigs and also with our existing displacement pile systems. So I was really relying on feedback from site personnel uh, in relation to our new CDA pile. I did find this feedback very, very useful, and it did result in some changes to the geometry of the tool as we went along. This is mainly the bottom section of the tool um, in terms of the length of that section and also the chamfer on that section. This was to aid the pile installation. So where possible, we carried out sacrificial testing where we could. So we were taking these test loads to either what is calculated as safe structurally for the pile, or we were curtailing it at around 30 mil settlement or there thereabouts, whichever we reach first. So we took this sort of, I guess, arbitrary 10% of pile diameter as our criteria. It's actually quite a commonly adopted approach um, to indicate a, a threshold at which the shaft of the pile could have been mobilized and that the loads now getting towards the pile base. So the CDA piles in the ground conditions, the clays and sands that we've been testing, we're predominantly relying on shaft friction of the pile. So we need really to try and reach a high level of displacement to look at the pile performance. Where there were instances where we couldn't take the pile to these levels, which are usually due to restrictions on site, um, we extrapolated the, some of the data we had to try and estimate some capacities. Usually we reached in excess of the working load, so we could still look at this from sort of an SLS point of view. So you've got a very basic sketch on the right of the screen. Uh, it's just to illustrate in a potential CFA pile of London clay. So you've got your shaft friction over the pile area um, will be calculated as alpha CU over the area of the shaft of the pile, uh, the CU being your undrained shear strength. And alpha is effectively a reduction factor for the contact between the pile type and the soil. So London clay for CFA, this is usually published as 0.5 nowadays or half of the undrained shear strength that can be mobilised for load for the pile. So for our CDA pile, we were able to calculate alpha values for clays uh, and the equivalent, which is KS tan delta for granular soils, um, using the site investigation information for the projects. We looked at the performance of other piles on that particular site and obviously the test results from the individual pile itself. When we looked at this information um, that we'd gathered, it was repeatedly confirming to us that the shaft friction of the 300 mil displacement pile was significantly greater than the equivalent 300 mil CFA pile. And it was more towards line of values adopted when we were looking at calculating skin friction for our larger displacement pile. So as a result, we kept our design diameter of the pile set at 300 millimeters. And at the moment we're using that on our design for our live projects. <clears throat> so while on site, we were also able to experiment with installation techniques during this, these uh, trials. Uh, for example, you had the number of rotations per meter on both penetration and extraction of the tool. And we needed to incorporate these into our formal method statements for the product. These actually are now essential because we're looking to disseminate the product onto live sites throughout the business. So we need to ensure we have a consistent, safe installation and a consistent quality of the product that we're installing. It's just a little snippet here of some of the results from a trial at Ashford. So with this pile, we've got the load displacement here mapped out. Um, we were able to look at the performance of what the SLS was for that particular pile. 
Um, and because we took that in excess of our 30 to 35 millimetres, we could get an idea of our predicted ULS. Um, at Ashford site, we also, on this site, monitored changes in levels. Um, we set that up at different radiuses from the pile that was installed and also from the anchors. So we could try and double use the information from the trial, not only to get capacity information, but also give us a bit of data on the potential effect on adjacent structures, for example, or site levels by the actual method that we're installing the pile with. So in order to reach the next stage of our R&D development towards the end of our flowchart, this is dissemination of the product to all of our regions across the UK. We firstly have to make sure that we've got all our method statements and risk assessments produced um, with, in line with our QA procedures. And we also produce some internal design guidance documents. Um, so these were to detail the pile geometry, the design methodology, the parameters, and also where this product is applicable. We could then roll this out to the regional managers via these documents. Uh, I also gave some presentations to the relevant parties because we did need the opportunity for any questions to come out regarding the design, the installation, and also from a business point of view, the costing of the product. So great, the pile is officially available for live projects in 2020. So the first project where we had our CDA piles installed as working piles was this project here. This is a school site in Billericay uh, out in Essex. At this project, we had over 400 piles and the vast majority of these were CDA piles. The relatively light pile loads we've got here, these are exactly where we were pitching our CDA uh, in our original R&D scope that we had. And the stiff clay ground conditions are also where we have the most trial data. We actually did install some CFA piles on site because we were quite close to some adjacent school buildings. Which is really good for us because it gave us the opportunity to do some comparisons on site. So when we compared the CDA piles, these are 40% shorter than the CFA piles on site. Uh, and on average, they worked out to be 30% cheaper. As the CDA piles are shorter and the displacement process was practiced and honed on site, we worked out that the CDA piles offered an estimated saving on the overall program for this particular project of about 35% comparing it to an all CFA scheme. An additional advantage that we had from this displacement pile was saving in Muckaway. So when we looked at that, we had an estimated saving of 400 cubic metres from spoiler risings when we were comparing it to 100% 300 mil CFA scheme. On this project, we were able to carry out five working static tests on the CDA piles that we'd installed, and all of these perform well and within the specification, the performance that we required. So as well as being essential to the project itself, and um, this also gave us more information to add to our overall database we can use when we're looking to refine the pile in the future. So we're also able to secure that project outside of the southeast. This is our second project. <clears throat> the uh, CDA piles here, they were installed in 2020, so not too long ago, actually during lockdown uh, in Swindon for a pharmaceutical site. These piles we had, they were more heavily loaded, up to about 450 kilonewton compression than the last site we did at Billericay but they were still within the zone where our CDA was providing a more economic option than switching it to our bigger displacement CHD piles. So again, for this project, we're employing these piles of stiff clays where we have quite a lot of background data for those. These piles on the project were installed to 15 metres length. We actually, for the design of these piles, we used design parameters gained from other trials and over consolidated clays and also site specific information to determine these pile lengths. On this project, we were actually able to also install our sacrificial test pile just to give us a bit of comfort in the uh, design that we had. And we tested this to more than two times what was the safe working load to around 1000 kilonewtons. And we had about 15 millimetres maximum displacement. So just extrapolating this using a basic chin method, for example, you're looking potentially at a ULS of um, about 30, 50 kilonewtons if you took 30 millimetres as your boundary. This data we've got, it backed up further our adoption of the alpha values that we were using in our design and for these types of soils. So we could add this to our bank of evidence that we're coming up with for performance of the pile in our over consolidated clay materials. So what next? Well, the product's now out in the public domain. We've had two projects completed, but there it really is another cycle to add to the R&D process. It's the same as with all other products. There's a constant refinement to improve the product. This might be refinement in its cost to the consumer. 
uh, design refinement, uh, market requirements may have changed, and also developments in safety. These are all part of maintaining the place of a product in the market and also within our company. So I think we can dive back into our R&D flowchart to product revision at all points during the life of the product. So we're making improvements to the product, but we're also widening its applicability as we go through that. So with a pile particularly, field testing is quite crucial. Um, in geotechnics, as you'll know, the performance of the soil in situ can turn out to be quite difficult to replicate outside of site. Um, there are quite a lot of outside and internal influences on behaviors of soils. And if you just have a small change to the properties of a soil or a rock, this can vastly change how it's behaving and therefore it could affect the performance of a pile under load. Because of this, we make sure that each project for the time being is going to undergo static testing. This means that we can add to our database of testing. So what we've done, we've set ourselves a formal review point for the design. So after a certain number of tests being carried out in a set of ground conditions for a range of loadings, we're going to review those specific information and the design to see if we can make any further improvements. Uh, in reality, every site's test results are already reviewed anyway as we go along. So we're checking for consistency with our design method, which you would do anyway with any type of pile that you're installing. We want to look at targeting additional soil types. So for example, chalk and terrace gravels, just to try and widen the applicability of the product we have. So for example, this soil profile here, you've got some soft clay and gravel over chalk, and it can be quite tricky installing the conventional displacement technique through a gravel such as this because what you'll get is a densification during installation, so it's more than a limitation on the equipment. This might be an example of a ground condition we'd be interested in trying with CDA, the new pile, is, is lower displacement, just to try and see if that's somewhere we can start looking at displacement piles. Something else we've trialled recently is connecting our displacement bullets to a smaller rig. So this is really following on from the work that was done with the IntelliTalk system that gave us information, so we knew how much torque roughly to install the pile is required. Uh, what this does for us is actually gives us access to more smaller restricted sites with the displacement techniques, which currently they're limited to the larger rigs. So you can see our CHD bullet, the larger bullet, in the middle of the screen attached to our current GX rig. So really to sum up, um, Roger Bullet have been installing the CHD piles for more than 30 years, but even up to today, we're really still improving this product. The most recent changes being that change to the modular cast section. Um, so you might make changes to, for example, with that section, allow easier maintenance um, for consistency of the tooling. We're reducing the day-to-day -day repairs we have to do. And we're also looking to improve safety when we're carrying out those repairs. So really, even with the CDA pile being at the stage it's at, um, in short, the development's never done. We're going to look to constantly refine that product to make the most we can out of it. I did manage to leave myself about 10 minutes. So that's a pretty good going for me. Um, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate you listening to my presentation and the opportunity to present here. Um, I do have about nine and a half minutes uh, left to go. So if there are any questions at all, um, just please let me know. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's a very comprehensive um, comprehensive uh, presentation. That was. We have one question um, from the chat. Um, coming from Louis Yates, is design based on undrained parameters so valid in a high displacement pile, i.e. is there a risk of getting the getting it down to residual phi? Residual phi? No, so I mean, uh, what I, I suppose what we look at for that is um, Imperial College London did quite a lot of studies on large displacement piles in terms of driven. I mean, they weren't percussive driven, they were kind of pushed into the ground with tubes. And what they um, observed was kind of a cracking around the surface of it. So it's really dilating, it's not really remoulding it as such. Um, and then what was happening is the kind of water is almost rushing towards the shaft and then you kind of get in a consolidation, the local consolidation of the material again. Um, mm. And, and they kind of looked at that um, with test results initially and later on and found that there's actually an improvement in the capacity of the pile the longer you left it because this is happening. So I think that's, that seems to be what happens with the CHD piles. If you look at the, the, the test results um, for them, sometimes it might be a, a few weeks until we actually test a pile for whatever reason. Uh, it tends to show an improvement over time rather than reaching the point of actually remoulding it. Mm, that's, that's quite interesting to know. Um, Luis, any more question from that, coming from that answer? 
Thanks. Uh, okay? do, do, do you have a, uh, where can I go to read that paper? It's really interesting, actually. I've never, yeah, sorry. It was just sort of really interesting. Yeah, it was one I found, I think I found it on my university portal when I was there at the time. It might be on um, like Google Scholar or somewhere. I'll find out what the name of it is, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's something like large you. displacement by two piles or something by, by University College London. So I'll have a look. By UCL. Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Um, next question coming from Bitter Ruti. Have you axiomed axiom a CDA pile? Have we what, sorry? I'm not sure what exhumed is. Assumed. Or exhumed, as in, yeah, excavated. So I had a look yeah, at it. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so we have, yeah. yeah. So, um, particularly on the site at Billericay, the first kind of one we did, obviously to install the pile caps and things anyway, they're excavating the piles. Um, we've also had to excavate the top of the piles to build a cap on for our static testing. So that gives us the opportunity to look at it because what we were interested in is making sure we're not really forming a flight because that's not the intention of what we were trying to do with it. We are trying to keep it as more to the core um, and the one that we excavated it's a very messy looking picture because it rained a lot which is why it's not in the presentation um, but the kind of pile looks a bit sort of just like it is 300 mil but it does have sort of a rough edge on it I mean most piles would anyway um, because it's wet concrete but we didn't have like an actual flight forming which was good because that's exactly what we were we were going for. Cool thanks then. Um, I hope that answers your question Peter. Yep yeah, thanks. Perfect thank you thanks for the question. The next one I've got from Jerry Love. Um, what sort of what sort of alpha values are you typically getting on your Steve Clay sites? Is it still around 0 0.5 and stuff? No, so you're um with your 0.5, I mean that there's a lot of studies on London clay for CFA. Uh, you're you're effectively cutting the clay when you're still on the CFA pile because it is it's got cutting teeth, that's that's what you're doing, and you're removing that material. So what you're left with is about half of what your undrained shear strength is. So with the displacement pile, you're not um, you are cutting that material as in to install the pile, but you're not removing it. Um, and the increase on that up on some of the trials was up to um, an alpha value of one on some of the materials that we had, which is kind of in line with what you'd expect for displacement piles. Um, anyway, if you're looking at precast driven piles, you can sometimes get them up to that sort of level as well. You're getting a lot better contact between the soil uh, and the pile. Um, obviously, you've got your sort of inherent factors of safety on that anyway. So you're not just saying, oh, 100 percent, it's one. Uh, but I mean, you know, in some certain ground conditions up to certain levels, we were getting those kind of values. Cool. Um, Jerry, are you have you got any more comment coming from that um, answer? Oh, I assume that's fine. Radio silence. <laughs> yeah. Shall we move on to? Shall we move on to next question? Question from James Bins. Are the piles restricted to low shear situations? Marilee's violent engineering. Yeah, Are so, the um, restricted to low shear situations. Low shear, yeah. As, as in, um, I'm, I'm assuming you mean sort of shear loads being applied to the piles. I'm guessing is what the comments relating to. Yeah, so yeah, I, I think, think that they're 300 mil piles. So it, the actual design in terms of the shear loading is not any different to a 300 mil CFA pile because you're structurally only looking at a 300 mil diameter area of concrete. So we're not taking anything else from that um, and the cage that you install on the piles uh, if you take into account say with, with these kind of techniques we work to 75 mil cover on each side so you might have a 300 core for the pile but your cage diameter is only 150 mil so you can only work with what you can get into 150 mil cage yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that's where the restriction comes from so yeah you, you know you're not we're not looking at these for big structures for heavy loaded structures you might be looking at schools housing commercial sort of low rise properties low rise properties okay yep so and anything we don't expect like massive um uh, lateral force um to be taken by these piles I suspect no it's not it's not really designed for that we can take a fair amount it does depend on the ground because your capacity of it to resist it does rely, uh, rely on your lateral resistance on your ground so in very poor ground you're not going to get as much lateral capacity out of it as you, you do uh, in some better ground conditions um this is kind of where we'd look then to go up to the CHD pile, the one we already have, because that goes up to a 400 core, yeah, 700 yeah. outer, so then we can use a 400 core. So we have a 250 cage, and we can get a bit more out of that. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the limit for that. And the thing with the rigs as well, it's the same rig for all the pile types. So you can just switch out that modular bullet bit that you can see there to the other ones. You could do some CDA because it's cheaper, then you could switch and do some of the larger CHD, and we can do that. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Another question coming from David. 
the pile construction is not entirely clear to me. Okay. Is it the case that the auger okay. tip goes to depth and then concrete is placed as it is withdrawn? Yes, that's right. So it's cast in situ. Um, yeah. So the one you can see on the screen, actually, the sort of rightmost picture where it looks really messy at the bottom of the bullet. Um, the very bottom of the bullet there, it's in contact with the ground. That's where the concrete comes from. So it is placed through the pole. So you are turning the pile to depth because that, that flight will rotate when you reach the bottom of your pile. Uh, you're blown off the bung like you would with a CFA pile and then you, you are back screwing yourself pretty much out of the ground um, and pumping the concrete as you go. So the rig's instrumented so we can see that pressure at all times that the concrete is going in because we need to make sure we're staying within the pile size that we need um, so you don't have any like neck into the pile or anything like that. Um, if uh, you go to our website You've muted yourself. Yep, you muted yourself, I think. Nicola. I think you muted me, I'm back. <laughs> Are you still there? Yep. Oh, perfect. Sorry. <laughs> Go I'm on. muted, that's okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Um, you, you, you were saying, I think we lost it's your website. Yeah. Oh, sorry, did I get cut off halfway through? Yeah, so uh, if you go on the website, there's the link to the CHD pile video. It's basically the same basic technique with a bit different rotation and things for the CDA as well. So just what if you have a look at that, it does show you the um, bullet actually rotating and then kind of a bit of a uh, animation of what it looks like being installed below ground. And there's a couple of case studies on there as well for the CHD pile. We're in the process of doing the case study for the newer pile. It's not on there yet, but it will be at some point soon, hopefully. Oh, cool. Excellent. Thanks for that. We've got one more question from Louis Yates. Any common objections from structural engineers slash issues with generic project specifications that you have to challenge to get around? Any integrity problems? Yeah, so we don't have, we haven't had any integrity problems with them um, in terms of specifications, because it is something that is um, more bespoke. So there's not that many people in the UK that do a cast in situ displacement pile. Uh, usually the specs we get, as everybody who works in piling probably does, are the same thing, 450 CFA. Um, so then you know, we might be doing driven piles, so we've got to change the spec for that. It's not dissimilar to that situation. Uh, the only thing with the displacement pile I'd say that's a bit different is, um, you know, if you're precast square pile, it's definitively 300 mil by 300 mil. It's clearly a square. Your CFA is 300 mil. It's clearly a circle because this is a different shape. Um, the common conversations you usually have regard the kind of interaction of the pile with their substructure. So because you've got this sort of 600 mil out, not on this product, but say on CHD, a 600 mil out of flight on it. So we don't need to um, design your beams for a 600 mil pile because that's not the structural element. The pile the structural element is just the core. So that's like a common one we have to sort of explain really is to do with the notation that we use of 300, 600 and like it's not 600 mil pile, it's actually a 300 mil pile uh, in terms of the interaction with the structural elements of the project and um, so that's really the most common one that we have. Cool. And you get um, engineers that kind of come, come back to us multiple times so once you've sort of gone through this once and I mean I'll go out to someone's office and show them the video and you can go to site with them and show them that and we have test results and things as well and um, once they're kind of on board they're generally all right, going forwards from that point, and then they ask you if they can do it on sites all over the place that might not even be suitable. And so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, we've got one question from uh, Chris Bennon. Nicola, you obtain very high design parameters from that from the back analysis of that test piles in a relatively immediate period between installation and testing. That is when for the pressures would be at the highest from the installation technique. Have you then explored any time dependence on test by performance, i.e. testing in months rather than days or weeks after installation? That's when the pore pressures are reduced and how this affects the performance slash the design parameters. Hi, Chris. It's Chris. I used to work with Chris. So yeah. I'll say hi to <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, a small Chris, world. Yeah, no, so Chris is fairly familiar with CHD pile design, hence why he's probably asking that question. Um, the ones that are on site where we're on live sites, we haven't been able to do that. Um, so we won't let us do that. We generally can't get rid of an area uh, over that time huh? period. What I will say is, um, and this isn't necessarily something that's in my presentation, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is uh, with the pile size that we've used, Pretty much, well, particularly in the solid materials, um, not so much the sands, 
Um, the actual back analysis of the design diameter is more than what we are actually pricing it on, which is a 300 mil pile. Um, so we're, that's why we've adopted our 300 mil pile as our safety point for that. Uh, so we're at the moment, till we can potentially, things I would like to do is maybe um, do an instrumented pile, uh, do a test like that where we could do a time lag, um, look at instrumenta uh, instrumenting the ground around it with piezometers and things as well. And those are all things I would like to look at um, sort of at some point. And I'd hope then that I'd be able to um, increase actually the capacity of the pile, um, I'm hoping based on the information that I've got. So I think at the moment our sort of fail safe will be that we're, we're taking like the smallest possible diameter because we can't say it's any smaller than that, um, clearly because it's spring drill court, but in actual reality, it's performing more like something in excess of that. Okay, cool, excellent. I hope you're happy with um, the answer then, Chris. Um, any more questions yeah. from the crowd? Excellent, thank you. How are you, Chris? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm excellent. good. Thanks, Nicola. Sorry for the awkward question. No, I knew it was going to be you. I saw you pop in the lobby at the beginning. <laughs> Glad you're here. Glad you're here. Thank you. Excellent. With that, um, we thank um, Nicola very much for the presentation. I'm just going to share my screen just for the last few minutes. Okay. Don't mind. Um, thanks so much again, Nicola, for that. And I hope everyone has um, benefited from that. I certainly have. Um, just want to share with you guys um, some upcoming BGA slash uh, BGA ECG events and awards that we have. Um, as I mentioned um, in the beginning, um, we are doing continuously doing this innovation and geotechnical engineering series, looking forward to have any um, speakers or who are willing to share with us their current development of any new techniques, anything interesting that um, you want to share with us, um, be in touch with me or the PGA um, ECG uh, team, and then we'll, we'll sort a day up for that. We have BJA Fund Award. Um, it allows BJA to provide financial assistance to any individual BJA members to further study um, or advancement of their career in technical subjects. More information on that in our website. Um, we also have Piling 2020 conference that is going to be held on the um, 25th and 26th of March 2021. That's been postponed a bit look out for that and then yeah actually before we say that we also have one C chartership professional review event that we plan to um, do on either next month or early in September that will be covering southwest region so in that event we are planning to cover the um, some hints and tips for those who are going for chartership and also we, we are planning to do a mock interviews on the day itself to give a bit of a feel um, what you would expect to have when you sit for your chartership. So with that, thank you very much everyone for diving in. It's really appreciated and I hope you stay safe and keeping healthy. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.